I'm happy to um, prepare the floor for Patrick Pama, who is managing uh, director of a uh, newly uh, established competence center here in Austria. It's the Chase Center uh, GmbH. Um, Patrick, I kindly ask you to switch on your camera and then I'm really happy to put the floor to you. Um, it's nice to have you here. Uh, we have some SASCAM um, um, history together and with other organizations and it's good to have you back here in the BioNanonet. So the floor is yours, Patrick. Thank you, Andreas. I hope you can see my screen. If this is the case. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for getting the chance to act again in this very innovative environment. Today I have the opportunity to present our new center. It's called CHASE and the acronym stands for Chemical Systems Engineering. So for the next 10 minutes, I will try to explain you not only what we are doing it, but also why we are doing it. So a short introduction, some words about our growth, and finally some information about our research. Growth uh, stands for the goals that we had right from the beginning, the reality that we were facing in our industry, especially the process industry, the options that we have identified, and the will that unites us as a consortium within our center. Everybody knows these slides. These are the sustainable development goals. They are really driving the industry now for the last couple of years. And there are big wishes, but unfortunately, also some obstacles. If you look at what these uh, sustainable development goals facilitate, you see that the industrial drivers and process industries are highly effective. The main industrial driver now is decarburization. And if you figure it down to technological challenges, this means we have to raise the applicability of alternative feedstocks, and we have to reintroduce material into the value chains. On the other hand, we have to keep process efficiency. This means our process has to be get more flexible. And on the other hand, we have to maintain and even raise the availability of our processes. We also have to reduce stranded chemicals, and this, without any discussion, is carefully looked at by our customers. They want still high product quality, and also with changing specifications. The topic that has accompanied the process industries, especially the chemical industry for the last decades, is of course health, safety, and environment. And this means if we change anything in our systems, we still have to avoid toxic intermediates and toxic waste streams. And the bad news is we cannot come up with single solutions because all of them are interrelated. Can we do it just on our own? Unfortunately not. If you look at the right side of this slide, you see that the chemical sales of Europe and this means the market position of chemical industry of Europe is declining. Although we are producing more and more, our share in global market is declining. And this means that we cannot change the world on our own. We have to become sustainable, but we have to keep our efficiency and even we have to raise it. Where are we now? Uh, some of the uh, people in the audience today are very familiar with this slide. This is a classical pharmaceutical process. Pharmaceutical processes are heavily discussed in the last weeks. If we talk about enzyme production and even the pre-products that you're needed for producing stuff like that. And you see that in pharmaceutical industry, still these processes are very wasteful and very slow. There is an indicator for this. This is the product mass index, and this means how much material you have to put in for getting some product material out. And you see that the ratio is typically 20. So you lose a lot of material on the way to your product. And there are even products that need more 
have mass intensity as high as 500 or even 1000. Next problem is these processes are slow. You cannot do it and you cannot change it overnight. You have multi-step processes where at each step you have to analyze and release for the next production step. All in all, this is still not efficient. Second parameter, most of these processes are not standalone processes. They are integrated mostly in large chemical production sites. So you have an industrial symbiosis there already. And if you have such kind of symbiosis, you cannot change just one screw in your machine. You always have to consider what kind of impact this will have to the whole machine in terms of material flow and also energy flows. Third point that we have to consider is we cannot look only just on our processes or even production sites. We have to consider the whole value chain. And the whole value chain, this is just the example of the polymer industry where you come in with a virgin feedstock like oil and you can end up with something like on the right picture. By the way, this is not uh, the southern hemisphere, this is a beach in Norway. You see that our linear production scheme does not work anymore. We have to reintroduce the material either by reusing it, recycling it in a mechanical way by solvents, depolymerize it, or bring it back right to the start, a real cradle to grave or to cradle approach. What if, what would be needed to do if we do it? And you see on the left side, and I want to start at the bottom, the starting materials. If we reintroduce used material, or if we reintroduce bio-based feedstocks, we have increased diversity, what we get in. On the level of processes, we have increased intensity and more flexibility that we need. And if we want to control all that stuff, we get a growing volume and a growing diversity of data sources and complexity that currently is definitely not a knowledge house, it's scattered knowledge. So what are our industrial needs? On the level of the starting material, we need sufficient characterization and traceability to keep the quality. On the level of processes, we need robust online control within large parameter spaces. Parameter spaces mean large flexibility of our processes. And on the data level, you have to bring all this together for a quick and adaptive modeling, which is now called mostly also in the media, a digital twin or a digital shadow. If we can manage these levels, we will succeed. Sounds very difficult, what are our options? And currently, the options are a geographical shift of chemical production to so-called low-cost countries. The second option can be we just do standalone solutions. There is somebody from the regulatory authorities that says we cannot do this anymore. Okay, we just treat the symptom, but we never touch the cause. What would be really nice would be some, to do something that really touches this related complex challenges. This was the main trigger for us to come up with a competence center called chemical systems engineering. This is just uh, a late afternoon uh, picture where you see industrial guys, guys from academia, people that really made up their mind. And they created a new knowledge platform on paper and we now turn this into reality. How do we want to succeed? On the gray boxes, you see our typical approach as we have it now. We come up with a feedstock, create molecules, turn them into materials, and then we have products. And we want to use them now at every step again. So what we need is our science-based manufacturing property spaces called digital twins that allow us to use it as a sustainable production system. We have structured that in three areas. One area is called digitization. Here we turn the data into knowledge. Another one area two, process intensification. 
Here we measure our parameters that we need. And area three, circular process streams, designs the processes that we want to get. In the field of uh, the research that we do, we have a simple approach. On the right side, we have the quality of performance that we need. We do an inverse analysis, and then we get the parameters and the materials that are requested. If we do this by process analytical tools, achieve scalable process understanding, then we can capture the information and implement this in digital twins and really can do predictive processing that is robust and sustainable. In area one, we have on the left side a real process, do something called hybrid modeling, and we end up with virtual processes where we can play around and set back a digital impulse that improves the real process. We can not only do this in classical chemistry, we can also do this in polymer industry where a strong market uh, pool is coming from. Polymer industry is very complex. This is why we are also integrating artificial intelligence or better known as deep learning right now. In area two, we combine process analytical tools and simulation tools. And in area three, we end up with very complex, but also very effective processes. And this one in the middle is a bioprocess where you can see on the left side that the chemical plant A is producing something that is, which is in fact not only a product but also waste. We use this, have a very well controlled process, and then we turn this waste into a product that can be reused in chemical plant B. Who are our partners? We have scientific partners, mainly Johannes Kepler University Links to Wien. But also uh, recent, I've seen Robert Holtz in the audience, Transfer Center for Polymer Technology, Software Center Hagenberg, and also the guys from Wood K Plus who are dealing with the biobased technology. I thank you for your attention and I'm open for your questions. <laughs>